Scott. And so our second speaker this morning is Hans-Joachim Hein from Imperial, and he's going to be talking about singularities of Taylor Einstein metrics and Claudia. <coughs> Thanks. So it's, it's a great honor for me to speak here. And like, like Simon said yesterday, Kalabi's, Kalabi's ideas have given us work for the last 60 years, and it can be a little bit more specific. They've, they've certainly paid my bills for the last six years, so <laughs> I want to thank you for that. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to give some sort of overview lecture about singularities um, of Einstein metrics. Um, mention some old results, some new results, and some speculation. Um, so we're looking at Einstein metrics, um, that's Riemannian metrics with constant Ricci curvature. So you're saying that the Ricci curvature of G is equal to lambda times G, where lambda is the Einstein constant, and that's going to be normalized to be either plus one, um, zero, the Ricci flat case, or minus one. And so more specifically, I'm interested in um, singularities of Kähler Einstein manifolds. Um, Um, and so the Kähler case has this beautiful feature that um, you can sort of split up the problem into a complex part and a metric part, or an algebraic part and a metric part. So you can always look, so sort of forget about the metric data and look at the underlying complex manifold, or hopefully, you know, algebraic manifold, or possibly algebraic variety, and then, you know, the idea is if you sort of if you if you if you if you understand the algebraic geometry well enough, um, so maybe singularities of algebraic varieties in some form, then hopefully that's going to tell you something about singularities of the associated Kähler Einstein metric. So this is going to be about the correspondence between sort of algebraic singularities um, and metric singularities. Um. And the talk is going to have two parts, hopefully. Um, so in the first part, I want to tell, so, so okay, so notation, so x, x is always going to be a Kähler manifold, so a complex manifold in the first place, or even algebraic manifold of complex dimension n. Um, you have a complex structure tensor J, um, Riemannian metric G, that's you know, Kela, so that J is parallel with respect to G, and those of the associated Kela form omega. Um, so that's that standing notation. Uh, so in the first part of the talk, I want to talk about the sort of first case where not everything is known. So that's that's complex dimension two, the case of complex surfaces, on so particular Einstein metrics on, on real four-dimensional manifolds. Um, and there I'm going to talk about sort of I'll show you a bestiary of you know, phenomena that are known or are conjectured to appear uh, in all three cases. So, I mean, the three cases are markedly different. So, for all three Einstein constants, lambda equal plus equal to plus one, zero or minus one. Um, in the second part, we're going to go up to dimension complex dimension at least three, and I'm restricted <coughs> going to restrict to the case that the Einstein constant is zero. So, Kähler Ricci flat metrics. Um, so, in the first part, I'm um, Gonna, probably going to be mentioning, them, mentioning some stuff that I did in my thesis. And the second part is you know, parts uh, joint work with, with Ronan Conlon and Aaron Neighbor. OK, so the first part is more of an introduction. Um, so we'll just, just, just recall that from. from um, Yes, yesterday, um, that we have we have we have a we have a necessary condition for at least in the compact case for the existence of of Kähler Einstein metrics, so for necessary topological condition. Um, for K E, um, and so that's that's sort of related to the first Chern class of your manifold. So that's C one of X, um, be either positive for lambda equals plus one, zero, or negative. Um, so in complex dimension two, you can say very explicitly what the manifolds with positive first Chern class are. That's the so-called del Pezzo surfaces. Um, so what we've what have we got here? So the blow up of CP two um, in K 
k points in sufficiently general position where k is between 0 and 8. Um, and then you've got CP1 cross CP1, but that's kind of an easy case because it's obviously Kela Einstein, just a product of two round metrics on the Riemann sphere. Um, then here up to, in the Ricci flat case, up to finite covers, we have um, tori, so C2 mod gamma for some lattice of full rank gamma, or otherwise um, famous K3 surface. And then for the, for the C1 negative case, we just attach a label. I mean, we would just call them surfaces of general type. Um, they're, just, they're just way too many, so we don't really know how many there are. Um, so maybe, maybe two quick remarks. So the first one is that the subdivision is sort of reminiscent of what we know in the complex dimension one case, so Riemann surfaces. Um, so for, for complex dimension one, um, the first on Riemann surface is the first churn class. So it's just minus, minus the Euler characteristic of your surface. And then you have the sphere, tori, or surfaces of genus at least two. Um, What's very different from the case n equals one is that there are many more complex surfaces than are exhausted by these three cases. So I mean, you could take um, you could take products like CP1 um, across a Riemann surface sigma g with genus at least two, something like that, because of make up mixed cases where the churn class doesn't have a definite sign and where there's a, a priori no hope of finding anything like like a Kela Einstein metric. So of mixed cases or fiber cases, so that's quite different um, from the Riemann surface case. Um, so that's a necessary topological condition, and then we have the, um, the corresponding existence theorems that the necessary condition in complex dimension 2 is almost always sufficient for the existence of a Kela Einstein metric. Um, so I'm going to make three cases one, um, two, three. Just continue here. So, in, so case three is in some way, in some sense, the easiest case, so that's the Obanyal theorem. Um, there exists a unique Kela Einstein metric on um, so general tribe is really a bit more general even than having the first churn class negative. But in these when the first churn class is actually negative, um, then there exists a unique Kela Einstein metric. Um, so the second case is, is Yao's theorem that there exists a unique um, Ricci flat Kela metric um, in each Kela class. And then in case one, that's, that's the hardest case that's been open for, for the longest time. Uh, so if that's been settled in work of Tian and Yao, um, that there exists a unique um, Kela Einstein metric when K is at least three. And it had been known for, for a long time. That's this Matsushima's theorem that was mentioned yesterday, that there can't be a Kela Einstein metric when you blow up one or two points. Um, So that's, that's, that's what's known about the existence of Kela Einstein metrics on, on complex surfaces. Um, and now I'm going to turn to that question, you know, what, what happens to the metrics if sort of the underlying algebraic surfaces degenerate? If, the algebraic surf if you have a sequence of algebraic surfaces that acquire singularities, then what do the associated Kela Einstein metrics do? How do they, how do they behave? So that's, that's, the, that's the question, um, um, what happens if you get an Einstein metric? Um, when xj degenerates. Okay, so maybe the, 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 the basic picture to have in mind is what's, what's going on in complex dimension one. So if you look at hyperbolic Riemann surfaces, then um, the standard picture out if you, you know, start with a genus G surface, um, you can degenerate that to something that has a node, so sort of an ordinary, ordinary double point from the point of view of algebraic geometry. And then what happens, what happens metrically in this picture is that, well here it 
kind of looks the same. It's a random hyperbolic Riemann surface. And then sort of in this limit, the, the constant curvature minus one metric sort of gets stretched out. And there's sort of an infinite cusp forming here that separates the two pieces, you know, these hyperbolic cusps. It's really infinitely long. But the question is, what's, what's going on in complex dimension two? What can we say in complex dimension two, really? So I'll try to give you one example in each of the three cases, sort of positive Einstein constant, um, Ricci flat and negative Einstein constant. Um, try to indicate whether how the, how the cases are different and what kind of phenomena you can see. Um, so if you go um, to the case of positive Einstein constant, so Ricci is equal to G. Then the first observation is Myers' theorem that tells you that the diameter <coughs> of the manifold is uniformly bounded by the square root of 3 times pi. So if all your Riemannian metrics sit, sit inside some sort of fixed, fixed box of a fixed diameter. That's some kind of compactness already. And then you sort of have the bane, the bane of Riemannian geometry that if you take limits of sequences of Riemannian manifolds, they can drop dimension. That's called collapsing. So I mean, even though the metric sits sit inside a box of fixed diameter, it could be something like this a priori. Um, we're sort of shrinking one direction um, and converting to some lower dimensional space. We don't really want that. Um, and luckily, luckily, we don't have that in the, in the positive case. Um, and we can use volume comparison to, to see that, that that's impossible. Um, so volume comparison um, with a positive lower Ricci bound, so the Bischoff-Gromov inequality tells us that the volume um, of a ball of radius r divided by r to the fourth, so it's volume ratio, this goes down as the radius r increases. So I have, an, I, I have a lower bound. I just take the radius r equal to the diameter of the manifold. Um, so it's going to be like root 3 pi to the fourth. And then up here, I have the volume of the, of the manifold. But in the positive Keller-Einstein case, the volume of the manifold is just proportional to the square of the first churn class. So up to this normalizing factor here, this is, this is basically C1 of x squared. So that's a topological invariant. So there's a topological lower bound on this volume ratio. And this means that sort of balls, geodesic balls of radius r look sort of uniformly four-dimensional on all scales r. Um, so this means that if I, I, mean, if I have a, you know, um, if I take a gram of Hausdorff limit, so I have a sequence sort of xi, ji that degenerates in some way. and have the associated Keller Einstein metrics um, xi, gi. And then I want to take a gram of Hausdorff limit um, as the sequence goes to infinity. So I'm converging to some me metric space a priori x infinity, d infinity. And I'm definitely going to know that x infinity, d, d infinity is sort of a metric space of finite diameter, and it's four dimensional because of this non collapsing conditions of x infinity um, has finite, finite diameter um, and is four-dimensional. So it's Hausdorff dimension four if you want. That's a good thing. Um, much more is true, actually. So that's this a problem that was studied in, that's actually an ingredient in some sense in the existence proof of, of, of Tian. In the, in, the positive, in the positive case, that you have an a priori result, what the gram of Hausdorff limit could be like, so if in the worst possible case. Um, that's, that's um, I guess there's, there's Mike Anderson, Bando Kazu Nakajima, and Tian, who proved that in the late 80s or early 90s, that this gram of Hausdorff limit is actually an orbifold. Um, with isolated singularities. And the singularities are of the form C2 mod gamma, where gamma is a finite subgroup of um, U2 acting freely on the unit, on the unit sphere.
Um, so what does it mean geometrically? Um, so imagine that's, that's, that's your gromov hausdorff limit, this four-dimensional orbifold. So the easiest case is when there's only one, one singularity, when gamma is equal to Z2, um, smallest possible group. So you're forming one orbifold singularity, the other thing looks like C2 um, mod Z2, approximately your space. Um, so that's, that's, that's X infinity. And then here you have a member of the sequence, sort of X, X sub I for very large I. You can imagine that there's some sort of little bubble forming. So this is X I, G I. Um, for i very large, so there's a little bubble of curvature forming. Um, some topology that gets pinched off and disappears into the orbifold singularity in the limit. And then you say, well, we want to understand what that looks like exactly. Um, it's called a bubble. Um, so what we do is we rescale here um, to make sort of the topology that's being pinched off have unit size. And then what's going to happen is that all the rest of the manifold, if we sort of scale up, if we zoom in with the microscope, all the rest of the manifold is going to be pushed off to infinity. And we're going to converge to some complete space here that's Ricci flat. Because before we were scaled, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Ricci curvature is uniformly bounded. And what we're, what we're going to be converging to is then a complete Ricci flat Kähler metric in complex dimension two. That's a hyper Kähler metric. So it's actually Kähler with respect to many different parallel complex structures. Uh, and that's stuff you dilate out, you get, you get a gravitational instanton. Um, this, is, this is actually one I, I constructed in my thesis. So, it's, it's, um, so it has the same, so if the same basic structure at infinity, so it's a half ray um, topologically cross um, a three-dimensional nil manifold, um, some topology inside. And the volume growth of this thing is so we had Iguchi Hansen with Euclidean volume growth. We had Taub Nat with cubic volume growth. So the volume growth here is um, r to the four thirds. Um, and the sectional curvature decays as slowly as it possibly could in dimension four for an Einstein manifold, so precisely quadratically. So scale invariant decay, so this means the, the metric size of the plug is roughly one. That's the only thing that fits, but of course you have to, you have to prove it. It's a complete type of Kähler manifold um, with a sort of asymptotic behavior. It's the cross section there, H3 or H3 modulo lattice. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, let's just say that this means Heisenberg group modulo lattice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Moving on. What is the complex structure of this? this uh, well, if you put an one, if you put a one here, you get an affine cubic. So if you want, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Or you can hyperkähler rotate it, and you get a rational elliptic surface. Um. So complex dimension at least three Ricci flat case. Um. So here's a simple, a simple algebraic singularity model. And if we want to understand it from a metric point of view. Um, so you take x, um, that's kd star, um, for a final manifold d. So d is a final manifold. What this means is you take the c total space of the canonical bundle of D and you collapse the zero section to a point. That's what I mean. That's sort of an algebraic cone, if you want. So somehow the picture is this. Um, you have D that has complex dimension n minus 1. X is n-dimensional. Then, And you're taking the complex cone over it. So you have a circle bundle sitting 
over here that's sort of the theta direction and then you just sort of cone it off in the usual real sense that's the r direction so you have r and theta it's a complex cone with us sort of as a complex cross section um, that's a kind of singularity okay I'll say d is a final manifold or maybe an orbifold so perversely so the most natural examples actually have d an orbifold rather than a manifold um, or orbifold So that's a type of complex singularity that you encounter quite often in limits of sort of kalabi yau manifolds, just algebraically, if you take an algebraic limit. Um, so what's, what's sort of the metric, the metric model for this? Um, why should there be a metric model in the first place? Um, so the, some sort of theorems in the French school of complex analysis uh, about weak solutions to the Monge Ampere equation. Let's say if you have a singular Calabi Yau manifold with sort of singularities, algebraic singularities like this, then there's sort of weak or singular Ricci flat metrics on these guys. You just can't say anything about what the metrics actually look like. It's sort of an abstract existence theorem on the level of Kähler potentials that tells you nothing actually but sort of the asymptotic behavior of the metric. So you want to make a good guess for that and try to understand what that could be. Um, there's sort of an easy case where you can make a good guess. Um, at least from the point of view of making a good guess, it's easy. Um, that's when D is actually Keller Einstein. Um, and then that's a construction that I think is implicit in, in one of Calabi's, Calabi's papers about so Ricci flat metrics on total spaces for canonical bundles. If so if this complex cross section of the cone D is Kähler Einstein, you can lift that to an Einstein metric on the circle bundle, that's what you would call a Sasaki Einstein metric, and then the cone over that is going to be a Ricci flat cone, actually a Ricci flat Kähler cone. So if D is Kähler Einstein, you can sort of lift that and metric and cone it off to get a Ricci flat cone structure. So there's your Ricci flat metric. That's a perfectly good guess for what the, what the model, model metric should be. So Kähler Einstein metric on D um, gives rise to um, a Ricci flat Kähler um, cone metric on X. Okay, so there's, there's your guess. Um, so now you might want to ask a harder question. Um, does that globalize? Um, question, next question. Um, suppose you have a compact Calabi Yau X hat. Some Calabi Yau variety in the algebraic sense, equipped with one of these weak singular Ricci flat metrics that we know to exist from sort of ploy potential theory. And let's assume that it has an algebraic singularity that's biholomorphic to X. Just <coughs> algebraically. Is it then true that the sort of the Ricci flat metric that's known to exist on the compact guy actually has to converge to that canonical model that you wrote down there? So do the singularities of the metric have to be um, conical? So is it is it true that G G X hat um, converges to G X always? And I think that's that seems to be completely beyond the reach of of, of current technology to say anything much about that, that problem. So whether you can actually have sort of singular Calabi Yau metrics with isolated conical singularities where you sort of guess the, co the right cone model in advance. There's sort of a theorem um, um, approved with, with, with Ronan Conlon. So that's um, and you could, you could phrase it as saying that infinit infinitesimally the problem, so sort of at the linearized level, the problem is unobstructed. Um, so if you're trying to solve the Calabi problem, construct a Ricci flat metric using the continuity method, sort of on a background space that has these conical singularities, then you actually do have openness in the continuity method. So if the linear part is okay, so you can solve the continuity method for a short while and sort of preserve the conical geometry. It doesn't sort of jump immediately to something else. The hard part is usually this closeness, well, so if you can go all the way from zero to one in the continuity method, and that I don't know if it's true. Um, but 
So if even the linear case, the openness is a, is a sort of a non-trivial non theorem that's kind of gap theorem if you want. Um, so the statement is if um, x is a Kähler cone, so in the metric sense, so really sort of a cone with a smooth cross section whose cone metric is Kähler um, with non-negative Ricci curvature. Um, and if you have a harmonic function u on x, harmonic, so it's a linear theorem, so we're passing u is equal to 0, and you assume it's subquadratic. Um, so it's little o of r squared. Um, then it actually has to be pluriharmonic. Some kind of Liouville theorem or cancellation theorem that if you restrict the growth of a harmonic function on your space to be less than quadratic is actually automatically pluriharmonic as a real part of a holomorphic function. And that, that tells you in some sense the obstruction to openness in the continuity method on those spaces isn't there. Uh, closeness is a, it's a different story. As, as R goes to infinity. Um, so there's, this is also true on, um, so from asymptotically conical Kähler manifolds um, with non negative Ricci curvature. So here's your, here's sort of your cone. Now you imagine you have an asymptotically conical space that's asymptotic to that cone at infinity. You assume the, the space is scalar with non-negative Ricci curvature as well. If you have a subquadratic harmonic function on a space like that, it still has, has got to be the real part of a holomorphic function. And somehow this is false on top nut. So top nut is Ricci flat scalar, but you can make a harmonic function of linear growth on top nut that's not actually pluriharmonic. So somehow this, this sort of maximal volume growth condition enters into the picture and sort of uh, tells you something about, about the behavior of these harmonic um, functions. So it tells is not asymptotically conical. It's cubic volume growth. But that's sort of the easy case where we could easily guess the right local model, but it's sort of probably still very hard to prove that the model is realized globally in sort of these X hat situations. Let's look at a different case where we can't even guess the right local model a priori. Um, so hard case um, is when D is not when D is not Keller Einstein. Um, so then we have this the singularity X is K D star. That's an algebraic singularity, um, and we don't have an obvious metric model. I should give you a sort of hands-on example for that. Um, the example is um, you take D, so that this has complex dimension n, so this has complex dimension n minus 1. So D is actually an orbifold in this case, that's Cp n minus 1. Um, the orbifold multiplicity is 1 minus 1 over k along a divisor, um, and the divisor is a hyperquadric, so it's Qn minus 2. It's a hyperquadric. And then this space x, kd star, if I do this complex cone construction, I get a very simple singularity. I get an ak minus 1 singularity. So x is just the ak minus 1 singularity in, 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 in cn plus 1. So it's a hypersurface singularity. So it's the locus of all points in cn plus 1, where c0 to the k plus c1 squared plus 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 cn squared um, is equal to 0. So in particular, k, k equals 2. Um, gives you the quadric for the associated stencil cone metric. Which in complex dimension 2 is the same as a Gucci Hansen. So when k is equal to 2, then on the quadric cone we do have a Calabi-Yau cone metric, so we do have a good local metric model. So the difficult question poses itself. Um, but how about other values of k? So that's maybe the most natural kind of singularity you could possibly look at. Um, So 
So it follows, it actually follows that's known sort of from work of Russ and Thomas and also from work of physicists, Gauntlet, Marcelli, Sparks and Yao, who study Sasaki Einstein manifolds, that when K, so using, using sort of stability type obstructions, you can show that when K is greater than two times n minus one over n minus two, then this orbifold there, so for this cone angle along a hyperquadric has no Keller Einstein metric. Um, So the algebraic singularity and AK singularity that occurs very naturally as a singularity of compact Calabi Yaws, but there's sort of no reasonable guess for a Calabi Yaw cone metric, and in a certain sense there can't be one. So then what's the right local metric model for this? Um, um, on the singularity. So I'm gonna make um, I'm gonna make a table here, tic tac toe table. Um, Let's say so if, um, k and we have n. So k could be two, three, four, five, n is as dimension three um, up, four, five, maybe. So k equals two again is the quadric cone where we have a stencil cone metric. So this is perfectly well understood in any dimension. This is okay. Um, now here you're obstructed in some sense. Um, so what, um, what's that region? So that's so here. Here we don't know what's going on. And so for the little more work, you can sort of extend this argument to include the equality case. So there's some boundary cases that are slightly more difficult, but you're still sort of ruled out. And one mystery case down here where people, I mean, the, there have been papers claiming that there can't be a calabi cone metric in, in, in this case here. So really the only admissible cases are the quadric cones that we already understood before. Um, so then here's the next theorem that I'm writing up with, with Aaron Neighbor. Um, So for um, k strictly greater than um, two times n minus one over n minus two, um, there exists a calabi metric. So Ricci flat Keller um, on a neighborhood of the origin on the ak minus one singularity. A local, a local metric, and the metric has an isolated singularity at the origin, but if you zoom out and if you pass to the tangent cone, you see something that has a plane of singularities. Um, um. From an isolated singularity at the origin, so metric singularity at the origin. Um, um. whose tangent cone has a plane of singularities. Oh, draw, draw a picture. Um, so picture like is this. Let's say this this box here is a k minus one. That's singular exactly at the origin. Um, so it, again, it's z zero to the k plus z one squared plus plus c n squared um, equal to zero. And now you project that thing onto sort of the special coordinate. So this is the z zero axis, um, and you see that the singularity is fibered by quadric surfaces. So if C0 is equal to zero. You have a singular quadric cone, so the central fiber that passes through the actual singular point, and here you've got smooth quadrics. 
these are tangent bundles of the sphere. So you've got these vanishing cycles here, these, these topological spheres. And the metric picture is that the radius of, so sort of when k is sufficiently large, when this power is sufficiently large, and this is exactly what sufficiently large means, so it's actually sharp, it's right at the boundary, then these spheres shrink so fast as you move in towards the origin that if you take the tangent cones, if you sort of dilate out by larger and larger factors and pass through a grom hausdorff limit, the cycles get pinched off, and the tangent cone that you see is um, so of a plane, a flat plane, across the singular quadric cone in one dimension less. But that's true on the level of the Ricci flat matrix. This is how the Ricci flat matrix behave in isolated singularity, whose tangent cone has non-isolated singularities. So the tangent cone. So that leaves the borderline. Okay, so. Oh. So the borderline case, when you have equality here, so it's these two guys, um, so we're not writing that up just yet, but the only thing that can be true in those cases is that you again have a local Ricci flat metric with an isolated singularity and with a tangent cone which is not simple, so whose cross section is not smooth, but it doesn't split off a line. So if it's more complicated, it has singularities, but it's just not, it's not the product of a plane and a simple cone. So, so, so the way this is, this is proved actually is so if you, if you guess a good local metric model, you make an ansatz for what the metric could possibly look like, and then you compute sort of its Ricci potential and you see that the Ricci potential goes to zero. So it's approximately Ricci flat in a suitable sense. And then you try to perturb it into a genuine Ricci flat metric, sort of maintaining the geometry. So the perturbative problem. Um, so you want to solve the mont ampere equation, the linearization of the mont ampere is the Laplacian. So what you need is good estimates for the inverse of the Laplacian on a space with roughly this kind of geometry. So you need charter estimates for the Laplacian on a space with this kind of geometry. And we do that using blow-up arguments, sort of Lee and Simon style blow-up arguments. Um, you need Leoville theorems for that on the possible blow-ups that you can get. And that's sort of the flavor of the theorem I was writing down before, that you want that harmonic functions that don't grow too fast actually have to be special. Um, real parts of holomorphic functions, for instance, things like that. Um, you ready to have about five minutes to say something about um, the mystery case. So what's going on there? So again, the proof of this, this theorem is based on writing down, guessing the right ansatz, right? So a, a right approximate local model. Um, but the formula for that local model that we have works for every k. And it makes sense for every k. Um, so in particular for, so for the cases sort of below, below the threshold. But in those cases, the, the ansatz works at infinity. It tells you something at infinity and not at the singularity. So, so when k is um, strictly less than 2 times n minus 1 over n minus 2, um, you can say that our ansatz works at infinity. Um, instead of at the origin. Um, So you get following following geometric picture. Um, so again, k k is strictly less than two n minus one over n minus two. Basically, only leaves two cases. Sort of the the, the vertical the column here. We have the stencil cone that's perfectly understood, and sort of this one mystery case. So let's look at the case first that we pretend we understand completely. So this one. So what's the picture there? So we have k, k equal to 2 and n greater or equal than 3 arbitrary. So here's this um, box picture of the A1 singularity. Um, I'm saying this, this ansatz that we made suddenly works at infinity in this case. So you get an approximately Ricci flat metric at infinity that looks like um, 
C cross um, sort of an, an n minus one dimensional stencil cone. But at the origin, we're sure in the good case, at the origin we have the n-dimensional stencil cone metric. So we can put that there. We could sort of put the origin further down. So here we've got um, sort of the n-dimensional stencil cone. So if, and if, you, if you have faith, faith in the solution theory of the complex Morge Ampere equation, um, what this suggests to you is that there exists sort of a Ricci flat interpolation metric, a Ricci flat metric on the total space that inter interpolates between an n-dimensional stencil cone at the origin and c times an n-minus one-dimensional stencil cone at infinity. So it should be possible to interpolate in a, in a Ricci flat way in between here. So there's one obvious sanity check you can make. Um, <laughs> compute the densities. So the monotonicity formula for Ricci curvature tells you that the density ratio, the volume ratio, um, volume of a ball of radius r divided by r to the real dimension goes down as the radius increases. So you should compute the, rate, the density of the end stencil cone and the density of this cone and check that they satisfy the right inequality. I mean, otherwise this is hopeless. <laughs> um, and so if you compute the density ratio, so that's the same thing that Brian White was talking about yesterday. Um, it's 2 times 1 minus 1 over n um, to the n. Here it's naturally 2 times 1 minus 1 over n minus 1 to the n minus 1. And that's a popular calculus exercise to show that it goes up this way. So when, when, when the dimension is 3, um, and this is half, the density is 1 half, and it keeps increasing, and when I let n go to infinity, it goes to 2 over e. So that, that Seems to make some good sense. Um, now, what does it tell us about the mystery case? Um, this is k equals three, um, n equals three. Um, so schematically, we have the same the same picture. So this is now the a two singularity in complex dimension three. Um, we we have this ansatz metric, this sort of fibered ansatz metric that sort of suddenly approximately reaches flat at infinity. So here we have sort of c cross the two-dimensional stencil cone, but we have nothing to put at, at the origin because there's these claims that this sort of, there is no nice, simple cone on structure on the singularity. Um, but so if, if this works out so nicely, then, then you know, how, how can this be true? I mean, can the universe be re really be so cruel that this space doesn't exist, but this one seems to exist? Um, you can do, do even more, so the density at infinity here is one half. And you can show that if this cone, if the simple cone existed, the density would have to be um, theta equal to 125 over 243, which is you know, just, just, just barely bigger than one half. So it still doesn't violate the, the monotonicity. It's barely bigger than one half. And so I was I was in China last summer sharing sharing an office with with Song Sun and I mentioned this this problem to him and he was just finishing up this this paper with Chi Li about Kela Einstein metrics with conical singularities, and he showed that sure we can show that the cone exists. So the question is that you know CP um, CP n minus one um, with an orbifold singularity of um, sort of a cone angle beta. Um, along a hyperquadric. So beta doesn't just have to be like one over an integer, it could be an arbitrary real number. So this orbifold here, according to uh, Lee and Sun, is Keller-Einstein. Again, using, using stability type arguments, if and only if beta, um, so it's always a final orbifold for any value of the cone angle beta, but it's Keller-Einstein precisely for I mean, of course you can go all the way up to 1, because if beta is 1, then you don't have any orbifold points, and they're just the fubini studi metric on CPN minus 1. So you, you, want, you want a lower bound, and the lower bound is, I um, oh, hope I get this right. Oh. So it's 1 over, one over this critical constant that's, that's appearing in this in this story. So this is saying that in particular for the, for the 
So for the mystery case, so these, these, these claims that were in the literature that this cone doesn't exist, they were actually wrong and the cone has to exist and sort of um, if the picture is, is consistent again. So you would suspect that there exists, actually exists sort of a Ricci flat space interpolating between these two cones. But again, to show the existence of these spaces, that's sort of solving the mont Ampere equation on a manifold with isolated singularities where the curvature blows up and that seems to be something that sort of I mean, they have to exist, they just have to, but that's something that is sort of beyond, beyond reach of what we can currently do. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thanks. Any questions? Yep. <laughs> That's not known. That's sort of, that's a sub-question. That's an easier step to the question I wrote down. That's not known. I mean, you would think if you can make a good guess, then you should be able to prove that that guess is always realized. But, you know, we, we don't even know whether, you know, different compact calabials with exactly the same local singularity types have to have the same local metric models at the singularities. I mean, it's, it's basically, I mean, it's the density ratio of the cone. So that's the same thing as the volume of the cross-section of the cone divided by the volume of the unit sphere. We know the volume of the unit sphere. Now the cross-section of the cone, I mean, what's the cross-section of the cone? That's a circle bundle over the scalar Einstein orbifold. So you want to compute the volume of the circle bundle over the scalar Einstein orbifold. The volume of the Keller Einstein orbifold itself, that's a degree computation. And you, you probably know that better than, 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 than I do, how you, you stick in the beta in the right place to, to, to make the degree computation come out right. And then, sort of, you have to lift that to the circle bundle, to the metric on the circle bundle. And that's sort of the, 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 the Calabians. That's because the, the length of the, I mean, it's basically the volume of the Keller Einstein orbifold times the length of the circle because you have a Riemannian submersion. So you only have to know the length of the circle, and that's, uh, I forgot, that's something like the index of the final orbifold divided by the dimension. So you have to compute the index, the divisibility of the canonical class. That's a, that's a Calabian that's Just degree computation plus Calabian that's. Okay. Another question, yeah. I was a bit confused yeah. by the statement of the theorem. You say that you can always find some Calabian metric, even in these x cases, where, where there's an x. Right, so what the x what the x means is that um, okay. So you have AK minus one. Um, topologically that's a cone. Topologically this or even holomorphically, this is really sort of some compact cross section and then crossed with a real line and you put a warp I mean you, you don't put a metric on there just yet. Just topologically it's a cone. What these x cases mean is that there is no Calabi-Yau cone metric on these guys. So there's no sort of what product metric of the form dr squared plus r squared g, um, so L is the link, L is the cross section, which would be Calabi-Yau. Whereas in the, in the good cases, there is. So in the bad cases, I mean, you would, I mean it's, it's topologically a cone, so you would hope that it's actually metrically a cone as well. But the x means in those, so in most cases, it can't be nice cone metrically. And what it is instead is this sort of more complicated thing where the cross section isn't smooth but actually singular. We have sort of the oh, cone. Right. Yeah, okay. But you don't solve the Mont Ampere together. Sure, we do. Well, do. So we make an ansatz for the metric. And then we find that the metric is the ansatz is approximately Ricci flat, but it's not quite Ricci flat. We sort of can't make it Ricci flat by bare hands. We don't write down an explicit solution. But so we have to solve the Morgan pair by perturbation. So you can use the implicit function theorem to solve the Morgan pair. So it comes down to inverting the Laplacian, and then all the analytic work is solved in getting good enough estimates for the Laplacian on the space like this. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Javier again. Thank you.